We're going to turn to Romans chapter 4. We believe in a doctrine called dispensationalism. In other words, we believe in rightly dividing verses to the right group of people and right time period. Because if you don't do that, then you're going to combine all the verses together, and then you're going to come up with major, and I mean major, wrong doctrine. So it is very important that you got to rightly divide things in its proper place. Now, one of the doctrines that we believe in, which is totally different from hyper-dispensationalism. Hyper-dispensationalism, they're also known as mid-axe churches. So you got to avoid these people called mid-axe. You'll notice in, th in the name of their church, they usually call it grace. So they'll dub this in the name of their church. If you see that, you got to avoid these guys. Because they believe that grace wasn't shown until the Apostle Paul. Until Paul, that's where grace is found. And because of that, that's why New Testament churches, which is us today, the Christians today, that's why we're known as grace churches, the hyper-dispensationalists would like to call it. Because we're otherwise known as the period of grace. But this time period, none. This time period, no grace. That's what they insist. Now, we fully deny that. We fully deny that. We believe that there was grace during the time of the Old Testament. There was undoubtedly grace before Paul. There was grace before Paul. To say that there was no grace until the Apostle Paul is not true. We see grace right here. We're going to look at uh, Romans chapter 4. This one is a strong passage you can use. Romans chapter 4. <clears throat> we will read verse 1. What shall we then... Uh, what shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, <coughs> he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is a reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. So notice right here that we see grace shown to Abraham. And Abraham, in this instance, he was not saved by works. You notice that? It's clearly only faith. It's not works here. So hyper-dispensationalists will keep insisting that it was throughout the Old Testament and there was not a shed of grace shown until Paul. That's not true. You see grace throughout these moments of time with Abraham. Not only Abraham, David's like the greatest example of that. Look at David at Romans chapter 4. Look at David. This is a blessing for King David especially. Look at verse 6. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is a man to, the Lord, uh, to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Now, also look at the book of 2 Peter, 2 Peter. I'm going to show you so many verses right here where these individuals were actually saved despite of how rotten their works are. I mean, if you look at their works, it's really awful. So you can't honestly say that they were good enough in their works to go to heaven. There was a lot of grace that God shone upon them. Look at 2 Peter chapter 2, 2 Peter chapter 2. And we will read verse 6, 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 6. So David is also one of them. Not works. It's grace. So this thing should not be crossed out. We see grace given to Abraham. We see grace given to David. Now we definitely see this in Lot as well. This is before Abraham, you understand. Before Abraham. So look at 2 Peter chapter 2. And you'll notice that grace was also shown with Lot. Now look at Lot. Remember, he committed incest with his daughters, right? He's a poor testimony of a person who will be saved by works. But look at right here, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 6. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly, and delivered, what? Just Lot vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that, what did God call them? Righteous man. Really? 
a man who committed incest with his daughters, dwelt among them and seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. So notice right here, God considered Lot to be a saved person, not to be part of the lost Sodom and Gomorrah. That's a lot of grace the Lord shown Lot, actually. So he's a poor example of a person who would be saved by works. Another one is Samson as well, Samson. Look at the book of Hebrews chapter 11, Hebrews chapter 11. He's considered to be part of the heroes of faith. Now, you got to be kidding me. You're serious? This guy? This guy, he was fornicating with a bunch of people, even harlots. It's like, what in the world? Really? So you'll notice right here that Samson, that he was shown more grace than he deserved. Look at the book of Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. And notice what the Word of God reads right here in Hebrews chapter 11 concerning Samson at verse 32. And what shall I more say? For the time would fail to tell me of Gideon and of Barak and of who? Samson. See that? But he's part of the heroes of faith because look at verse 33. Who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lion, etc. And you'll notice <clears throat> they go to heaven. Uh, look at verse 39. And these all, see that all of them, including Samson, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise, God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. See that? In, their, in time, they don't receive the promise now up in heaven, but in time later on, they will receive it. So Samson is considered part of the saved people. Now, that's, so that's, those are the verses you can use to debunk mid-Acts grace people. There is no doubt, there's a lot of grace, right? You've seen a lot of grace right here, right? Who, who in, would God let some person who just fornicates with people, a great example of a judge of Israel, right? What if your pastor start doing that? <laughs> great example, right? Lot committing incest. We see Abraham and David. Not only that, the greatest one is probably the thief on the cross. Jesus did not die yet, let alone Paul preaching the gospel of grace. And the thief on the cross, what, you think he was saved by works? Absolutely not. He just got saved. He got in right there. Now, there's another extreme, though, you got to avoid. This is called covenant of grace. Covenant of grace is a Calvinist doctrine. It's a Calvinist doctrine. And covenant of grace, there are people who are anti-dispensationalist who go with covenant of grace, and there are people who claim to be dispensationalist, but they are covenant of grace. But these guys who claim to be dispensationalist, they're weak dispensationalists, actually. We see here hyper-dispensationalism. This one is going to be weak dispensationalism. So the bottom line is this, dispensational salvations. This one is the number one thing how you can find weak dispensationalism easily. People who claim to be dispensationalists, a lot of them deny dispensational salvations. What is dispensational salvations? We believe that in different time periods, they had different plans of salvation. Now, dispensational salvation, uh, excuse me, not dispensational, covenant of grace adherence, they would use Romans 4 because that's all the gospel they know. They don't know much Bible. They harp on Romans 4 and Romans 4 to prove that people in the Old Testament were saved the same way like we were. That, they were, that there were no works involved in salvation. It was purely grace alone, not of works. No, that's another extreme we deny. Now, you might say, well, pastor, I thought you pointed out these people who were saved by grace. Yes, absolutely. There were some people who were saved by grace. But the thing is this. In the Old Testament, it's not just works, like hypers would try to give the idea. And it's not just faith, like covenant of grace would say. It's faith and works, you got to understand. 
So you got to realize this. Where these people's works failed, God gave enough grace to make up for it. That's how God works. But it's a combination system of faith and works you got to understand. Now, they all use Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11 is easily debunked. We saw Hebrews 11, Samson saved by faith, right? Uh, and you're going to find out a lot of other people. Noah saved by faith. You see Moses saved by faith, etc., etc. But if you look at Hebrews 11, it's so easy. It shows their faith, but it also shows them doing the works as well. For example, it says Noah by faith built an ark. Okay? Yes, he saved by faith. But do you think it's not a lot of work to build an ark? If I told you you need to go to church for your salvation, you would accuse me of saying good works. But if I told you to build me a church building for your salvation, you would say, that's a lot of works. But if I told you to build an ark as big as a football field, you would say that's definitely works and not faith. People who claim that Noah was saved by faith alone, there were no works involved, I'm sorry, you don't have common sense. So dispensational salvation is undeniable. You can't deny works involved right here. So we're going to look at Romans 4, which we saw. Now, I'm going to show you something. Compare with Romans 4. But what are we going to do with Romans 4? Well, it's simple. Compare that with James 2. So keep your hand at Romans 4 and go to your other hand at James chapter 2. We're going to look at Romans chapter 4, and we're going to also look at James chapter 2. Now notice Abraham, yes, he was saved by faith, not works. But look at this. In Romans chapter 4, verse 3, it shows you the time period. In Romans 4, 3, it says, For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Do you know when that happened? When he was saved by faith, not works. When he believed and it was granted him imputed righteousness. Look at James chapter 2. Now look at verse 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect. Now that's a problem right here. James, on the other hand, says that Abraham, he was saved by works, not just faith. Well, we got a contradiction here. He's saved by faith, not by works. But James says, no, there were works added on top of faith. Is this a problem? No. Abraham believed God, it was imputed unto him for righteousness. Do you know what time period that was? That's why we believe in dividing time periods. When he believed in the stars. That's at Genesis, right? Because he believed in the stars, the book of Genesis says, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. James 2 says he was what? Offering his son Isaac. This was many years later. Many years later. That's why James 2 says, by his works, offering his son, was faith, right here, which had no works at that time. Had no works at that time. And then James 2, much later on, a different time period, by doing this work, his faith was made perfect. Right? That's what it says at James chapter 2, verse uh, 22, right? Our faith is not made perfect by our works, folks. Our faith is already made perfect by Jesus Christ himself. All it takes is by faith you receive Jesus Christ. That's perfect enough. You don't need your works to perfect your salvation by faith. So you see, there's no doubt there's a dispensational salvation where you can't deny any works involved right here. But look at this. Uh, verse 21, Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son upon the altar. See that? It was when he offered his son Isaac upon the altar. Now let's also look at uh, Ezekiel chapter 18, please. Ezekiel chapter 18. Ezekiel chapter 18. 
Now, what about King David, right? What about King David? Well, the answer is simple. Now, we're not going to look at these verses, but I encourage you to look at the verses. He's the author of the book of Psalms, right? Did you read the book of Psalms? If you read the book of Psalms, David did not deny that there was a work system involved in salvation. There is no doubt about that. For example, in one passage of Psalms, David said, Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? Who shall dwell in thy tabernacle? In thy holy hill. And he says, They that keep themselves clean, that are upright in heart. He also says that our righteousness is dependent upon those who do his commandments at the book of Psalms. Psalms is all over concerning works. And all you have to do is just take a simple look at the book of Psalms. That's it. It shows works all over. So David, even though he was saved right here uh, by faith and not by works, he could not deny that there, was a, that there were works involved in salvation right here. Now here's the thing though. How do we explain the rest of these people? The rest of these people, it's very simple. How you do it is first let's discuss Ezekiel 18. Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse uh, 21. <clears throat> but if the wicked will turn from all his sins that he hath committed, and keep all my statutes, and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. All his transgressions that he hath committed, they shall not be mentioned unto him. In his righteousness that he hath done, he shall live. Have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, saith the Lord God, and not that he should return from his ways and live? But when the righteous turneth away from his righteousness, and committeth iniquity, and it doeth according to all the abominations that the wicked man doeth, shall he live? All his righteousness that he hath done shall not be mentioned in his trespass that he hath trespassed, and in his sin that he hath sinned, in them shall he die. Verse 26, when a righteous man turneth away from his righteousness, and committeth iniquity, and dieth in them, for his iniquity that he hath done shall he die die. So notice right here that in these verses, Ezekiel 18 is a bloody verse. But not only Ezekiel 18, you also saw Hebrews 11, and then uh, James 2, and then you look at all over the book of Psalms. It says in Ezekiel 18, remember that verse says this, if the wicked turn from his wickedness and start doing righteously, then his soul shall live. But if the righteous man, after all of his righteous works that he does, and then he sins at the end. You know what that verse says, Ezekiel 18? He will die in his sin. See, you lose your salvation. You die in your sin. You burn in hell. Ezekiel 18 is utmost proof that there is undoubtedly works involved for salvation during the Old Testament. But how do you explain these instances, Pastor? Why it's very simple. Because the thing is this. God is what? Full of grace. As a gracious God, the Lord... He could not get them saved by faith alone in his blood. Why? Because the blood was not shed yet. Okay? It's at this time period. It was not shed yet. So the Lord says, for your salvation, it's going to be dependent upon not just your faith, but you're going to have to do works as well. However, the Lord, he is a gracious God as well. And there are certain people that he looks at their lives. And he will, when he looks at these certain people's lives... The Lord, because by His grace, He can make an exception. And by making exceptions, that does not overthrow the rule. Exceptions only prove the rule. I don't know if you heard that logic. That is a logical argument. When you find exceptions here, that only proves the rule. It doesn't overthrow the rule. That is a logical argument. That is a, a logical argument that phrase is used. Exceptions only prove the rule. Like, um, they give some samples, for example, uh, parking, uh, parking is restricted here except employees. So the exception of the employees to park on that spot only proves the rule to the person that, hey, I can't park at that spot. So that's one example of exceptions only prove the rule, but you can find many other examples. Not only that, God is a gracious God because he knows each person's heart, right? So he knows each person's heart, and he's an understanding God. 
So because as a gracious God who understands and he knows everybody's different personalities and characters, you and I don't. You and I don't. So out of his grace, he understands a particular person's heart because you got this thief who's dying on a cross and there's no chance that he can make up, a, make up for it with his works. So as a gracious God, the Lord lets him in and says, I will make you an exception and have my grace put you in. See, that's what God does. That is natural. Even in everyday life, you got to understand, in everyday life, if you're working in a job and the boss requires you to work, that doesn't mean there's absolutely no grace in between. Sometimes you get grace periods, right, at the job. Why? Because it's understanding of your exceptional situation that you go through. That is just common sense in everyday life. You got to realize God, uh, God is a person too. So he's going to be very understanding. But he's not just going to use his gimmick addict to like, okay, I'll just shed you grace, 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 and grace. And your boss is just going to give you grace, grace, and grace and doesn't require you to work at all. See, he doesn't do that. Works are definitely required in old, before Paul. Why? Uh, before Jesus died on the cross. Why? Because he did, Jesus did not die on the cross yet. It's that simple. When Jesus died on the cross, that blood washed away all your sin. Thus, none of your work is required to make up for it. All it needs is you just throw that faith on him, and it takes care of that. So thus... This doctrine is important, dispensationalism. So dispensational salvation is an important doctrine that goes in the balance. These two are heresies. And if you go to any church that teaches these two doctrines, they got to be corrected. These two are wrong doctrines.